Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV, I'm Andrew Sumner and today I'm sharing with you the Star Trek comics and books panel from New York Comic Con run by my colleagues at Titan Comics and hosted by the mighty Jonathan Wilkins and the mighty Nick Jones with a range of guest stars including the awesome, the one and only Una McCormack talking about her new novel, The Autobiography of Mr. Spock. And the guys are also talking about the great new Star Trek magazine, Star Trek Explorer. Enjoy. Hello, welcome to New York Comic Con 2021. Yes, it's 2021. I can't believe it's 2021. It's going to be the 23rd century before we even think about it. It's time is ticking on. Great to see you all here. We've got a great panel today. We've got uh, a journey into the world of Star Trek the Titan panel, we're looking at the magazine Star Trek Explorer. We're looking at uh, the autobiography of Mr. Spock. That's right, he's written his autobiography. Can you believe that? I can scarcely believe it. Um, somehow. And uh, we've got special guests today. We've got, um, uh, we've got Una McCormack. We've got James Swallow. We've got Lisa Klink. And we've got uh, Nick Jones. And I should I should actually tell you what all these people do, uh, <laughs> which is otherwise it just faces. Um, <laughs> Nick is the editor of Star Trek Explorer, and Lisa James and Una have all written stories for the first issue. Uh, they're all acclaimed uh, authors in their own right, um, but have also written Star Trek. Uh, episodes for TV. In Lisa's case, you've written uh, numerous episodes and been working behind the scenes on Voyager and Deep Space Nine and and even wrote a, uh, a ride, the yes. 4D Borg experience, which is, um, that, that must be top of the list of your fav <laughs> favourite things to write. Um, that was and, a lot of fun. <laughs> and so I'm going to start off really just to get to know you guys. Um, by asking, um, we're all fans here, I guess, as well as professional writers. Um, what made you, what made you get into the show? What turned you from a casual viewer to a fan? Um, and we'll start with Lisa. Uh, well, I, I first got exposed to uh, Next Generation in college, and all of us in the dorm would get together and watch Next Generation together and talk about it and analyze it and you know pick it to pieces and you know like you do and uh i think that was really what kind of grabbed me and then when deep space nine started um by that time i was thinking about a career as a writer and so i've kind of watched it with that point of view and then when voyager started um i had you know an opportunity to get on staff there and so obviously that made me a huge fan absolutely and um una your earliest experience with star trek Oh, and Star Trek had sort of three goes with me. So uh, in the 80s, when I was, uh, I must have been about 11 or something, I saw the one with the whales, which I thought was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Uh, and then I was quite a serious minded uh, uh, teenager. So when I was about 16 or 17, Next Gen started in the UK and uh, a measure of a man, this were all things, you know, I really wanted to debate and be serious about. Uh, and then in my sort of mid 20s, uh, I started watching Deep Space Nine. And uh, with a uh, friend lent me the video of Way of the Warrior and Andy Robinson walked on screen. I thought that was just the best, the best <laughs> performance I'd ever seen in a TV show ever. And uh, I've not really looked back. So uh, that, that's how I got into it. Oh, well, uh, firmly ingrained in Star Trek. There. Um, so, James, what, what was it that did it for you? Well, you said, um, how did I go from being a casual fan? I was never a casual fan. Ever, I, for me, it was uh, the the nineteen eighty BBC Two uh, reruns of the original series, coming home from school and then just tuning into that. That's kind of like what got it got its hooks in me. Star Trek was kind of like my first fandom, and uh, you know I've loved all of it ever since. So I started watching the original show, and, and I, I was one of the people who was kind of contributing to fanzines and helping work at, at fan conventions and stuff like that. So. It's kind of, it just seems like a logical progression for me that when I eventually decided I wanted to be a writer, that Star Trek would be something that I would write professionally. Hmm. Wow. And Nick, what, have, what did it for you? 
Uh, it was, well, I remember watching the original series on, uh, like, like James, on uh, BBC Two, the, the repeats, probably more like the, I guess, my, more like the late 70s for me. Um, so, I mean, that kind of gripped me, you know, when I was a kid, I loved it. I loved things like Charlie X and, you know, some, some of it was quite terrifying as well, so it was great. Um, but uh, it was Next Generation, I think, that really made me a fan because that was when, that, when they started showing that on BBC Two, um, that, you know, I, I just fell for that straight away. It was, you know, it was, well, well I was, I'd, I'd liked Star Trek up to that point and I'd loved the movies, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd gone to see the, I'd probably gone to see, must have gone to see Motion Picture at, at the cinema and I probably went to see Wrath of Khan and I probably went to see Search of Spock. But when Next Generation came on, that really made me a fan because that, that was like, you know, that was uh, just a step on, really, in terms of what Star Trek could be and what it was. So I, I just opened up that, you know, a whole new universe. So that's really what did it for and then, you know, you know, after that, um, Deep Space Nine and Voyager and what have you. But yeah, Next Generation, I would say, was the one that really made me a fan. Yeah, well, I guess once you're hooked, you're hooked. That's it. Yeah. That's yeah. it, isn't it, really? There's, there's no escape. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you want to escape from Star Trek? Um, <laughs> so, so, Nick, obviously you're the editor of the new uh, Star Trek Explorer magazine. Yeah. What can you tell us about the first issue? Uh, well, it's, got, it's, I mean, it's a, a brand new magazine, but it builds on what we were doing previously in Star Trek magazine and, and before it before that even when uh, I mean going way back the, we launched um, uh, Star Trek Monthly I think it was 95, 1995 was, was when that started and then uh, that, that became uh, Star Trek Magazine about 10 years after that so Titan's got a very long history with, with Star Trek Magazine I've, I've, I've been the editor of Star Trek Magazine and I was editor of Star Trek Monthly at one point as well so, so I've got a very long history with it as well but what, what, we, what we wanted to do was just um, now there's so much new Star Trek. There's, you know, obviously since Discovery came along, there's so many new series now. Discovery, Picard, um, A Strange New Worlds, uh, Lower Decks, you know, Prodigy, and there's just more and more all the time. So it seemed like the right time to just, you know, launch a new version of the magazine. So there's some familiar things in there. You know, people who've been reading the magazine for a long time will find some things they know, like Larry Nemechek's A Fist for the Data and... Uh, things like technology, regular columns that, you know, people love and we, we didn't want to do away with, but there's some, you know, really new things in there as well, some exciting new things. Fiction is the big thing, which we'll be talking about, obviously, which is why um, uh, these guys are here. But uh, so, um, but as well as that, there's a magazine within a magazine There's uh, called Inside Trek, where we go in depth on a particular subject and the first issue is on uh, Kirk. It's, I mean, the idea with, it is to, with the magazine is, to, is to, for it to be something that new readers can pick up as well as uh, old, as well as more seasoned readers like myself. So um, it's, it's, it's a balance between the two really. So, and we've, so we've got things like a definitive guide where we go, uh, go in, and the first is, issue that's on Enterprise. So it's definitive guide to that series. We've got, um, I think called the Q Continuum where we ask some of the great and good of Star Trek a question, a burning question of the day. And the first issue of that one is uh, uh, who, who belongs in the Star Trek Hall of Fame. And there's, you know, interviews as well, which is always a big part of the magazine. So, you know, we've got interviews with Blue Del Barrio and Ian Alexander in the first issue. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very, and David Cronenberg actually in the first issue as well. So there's some great, some great interviews in it. So it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a new magazine with a bit of the old as well, but so a bit of the familiar, but um, and, a, and a rather rather swish new look as well, I think. So um, yeah, we it's come it's come together nicely, I think, and that's the mission going forward. You know, explore is the key, really. That's the that's the key word with all this. It's to is to explore every part of Star Trek from the original series right through to all the new series and um, and films and what have you. The whole thing. I mean, it's a it's a massive cliche, and I feel terrible in front of all these writers using such a cliche. But there really is something for everyone. There uh, we yeah, are. No, Sorry about that. <laughs> that's the idea behind it. You know, it's, it's, um, and for somebody who's just new, for some, anyone, if you're new to Star Trek, you'll find we have a thing called Trek 101, which is just a basic nuts and bolts on a particular subject. So if you're new to Star Trek, you'll you know you won't. There's nothing to be uh, afraid of with the magazine. It's all you know. We, we guide you through it quite, quite uh, hold your hand all the way through, I think. So, um, yeah. 
Um, and as, as you hinted, fiction is a really big part of uh, what we're doing. And uh, we've got a series of stories based around uh, Q, who's obviously making his big return to the Star Trek universe in Picard, which is uh, incredibly exciting. I think he's one of the, the most interesting characters in the franchise, actually. He's really cool. Um, so I'd like to ask our writers... Um, Let's talk about uh, your story without giving away any spoilers, obviously, because we want people to buy the <laughs> magazine. But um, but uh, to maybe give your uh, story title and uh, just a little sort of uh, a little sort of, if you like, a, a trailer for what readers can expect. So um, maybe Una first. You know, I've absolutely blanked on the title. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry about that. I'm really about it's one of those things where uh, you know you're you're asked to recommend a book and instantly everything you've ever read comes out of your head. Uh, how much how much can I give away? I, 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 let's give people three guesses as to as to who else might be in this story. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is it Derek? Is it Derek? Uh, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> I'll try and remember the title before the end of this interview. It's a bit blurted out, forgive me. Hey, don't worry. It'll be a really nice surprise for the readers. You know, we'll, we'll take bets as oh, to I've what the title it. is. It's called, it's called A Night In, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. A Night In. That's it. I knew it would come back. There we are. The dangers of being a prolific author. You write so, so much, you forget. Oh, I, I think I'm just getting old. Yeah. <laughs> a Night In. Um, James, what, what have you got in store for the Star Trek Explorer readers. So um, mine's called The Offer, uh, and it comes from uh, the fact that I, I'm, I'm trying to collect the set as I write Star Trek stories, right? So I want to, if I can, before my career ends, I would like to write a story set in every single Star Trek incarnation. Wow. So, so as I'm going through, I figured, why not, right? You know, I'm kind of ticking them off one by one. Uh, and of course, the problem is I keep making new shows. <laughs> it's difficult to start, right? Um, but one of the shows that I haven't told a story in uh, was the Enterprise era. I kind of missed the boat on that one. So um, what I've told is it's a, it's a story featuring Jonathan Archer. It's set a few months before the first episode, Broken Bow. Uh, and I had a lot of fun with that uh, going back, especially because the show's been airing here on TV in the UK and I've been catching it. <laughs> it's kind of on at dinner time. So when I'm in the kitchen cooking, I can like watch, watch an episode of Enterprise at the same same time and hearing uh scott bakula playing archer and hearing his like voice in the back of my head i felt like you know what he's a great character i'd really like to have some a chance to sort of do some dialogue with him so it's a story about a kind of be careful what you wish for story uh, featuring jonathan archer cool and lisa what have you got in store for the readers Oh, well, I mean, when I knew I was going to write a Q story, I figured uh, I would write it with uh, what I think is the best Q relationship, which is with Picard. So I decided to use the Next Generation cast. And uh, I decided to uh, set my story on an alien planet in which we have an alien society that is worshipping Q as a god. <laughs> which, as you can imagine, Q uh, <laughs> finds wonderful. It's an, it's an incredibly Star Trek concept that it really is. I think Gene Roddenberry would be incredibly proud of that idea. I think uh -huh. it's really yes. good. Um, that's really cool. And we have another story that uh, the author isn't here today, but I can reveal is I think the first instance where Kirk meets Q. So um, yes, and hopefully not a continuity shattering <laughs> sort of thing but uh, i think it works i think it works we've been looking at it today and we, we've been kind of very careful to make sure it ties up so uh that i think is a first um that we have there um so what so i'd like to ask you all really what are the big challenges of telling stories um involving a franchise with themes as expans expansive as Star Trek. I mean, it, it's a big, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big sandpit to play in. Um, Lisa, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, well, fortunately, I kind of got my feet wet, you know, working on Voyager for three years. And so I, I guess I was kind of in the, in the mindset of what makes a good Trek story. Um, and so that's why I decided to have, you know, questions of like the prime directive and morals and how do we deal with Q and what are our responsibilities here? And, you know, some of this classic Trek questions are, which have always been intriguing to me. Absolutely. And uh, James? 
it's you know it's it's tough to to write a Star Trek story just from the get go from blank sheet of paper because there's such there's this huge tapestry of narrative. There's you know if you think of everything, not just the movies and the TV shows and the cartoons, you know if you expand it to we've got comic books and novels and video games and theme park rides and you know, we've got a huge a, a literal universe of star trek stories out there and so when someone says can you can you tell us a new one it's like well where do you even start because so much of that world has already been filled in so the the main difficulty is finding or well, who's a, can i find a place to tell a story that hasn't been told or can i tell a story that has been told in a different way and bring something new and fresh to it so it's always a, it's always a unique challenge but the flip side of that is that um, I often talk about the toy box that you get when you write in someone else's universe. And Star Trek is a really big, really cool toy box. And yeah. as a writer, it's just so much fun to be able to kind of open that lid and go, what do I get to play with today? <laughs> That's the excitement of it, I think, that never goes away. Have you ever sort of had an idea and thought, That's a fantastic idea, I can't wait, and then found it's already been done? Um, no, I didn't. I don't, I've kind of, I've had story ideas uh, which have been similar. Um, I remember I, I pitched a uh, story idea to Enterprise for the TV show. Uh, and I can remember talking to them about and being really super enthusiastic about this story idea I had. And they said, yeah, we're shooting that episode right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and unless they, unless Paramount had like a telepath working there, there was no way they could have copied the idea from me. Because at least at least you are sort of in sync with them i suppose but that's not much consolation <laughs> it was like they, they said to me well you're on the dartboard that's 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 good <laughs> you're closer to the center of the dartboard than you wanted to be but the thing is is, is because it's such a big universe there are so many stories you know if you've got a group of writers in a room and you said tell a star trek story people would have similar ideas but it's the it's the execution of them and and what you as an author bring with your unique voice that's the thing that makes them unique. Mm. It's very true. Very true. Uh, Una, what's... Oh, I think, well, that, what everyone said already, I think what was uppermost uh, in my mind, um, writing the Spock book, uh, was, was, was the continuity, was, was, was getting everything in place and n not contradicting something because it... it, it missing something or contradicting something it will be exactly the thing that that really matters to somebody mm -hmm. uh and and you don't want to spoil their star trek you know that's the last thing you want to do is to sort of you know something you put down on the page have someone read it and go well that's not how i felt about this character that's not how i read this character so you're very mindful um of that that these are these are characters and settings and um stories that people are, are really invested in and you want to you want to amplify that enjoyment and not spoil it. I think. Uh, uh, would you say? I mean, this is to all of you, really. Feel free to jump in. But would you say there are ways around almost every continuity problem? If you think hard enough, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I know one one thing we did in the in the Janeway autobiography was uh, there was something we just couldn't think of our a, a way out of. So. Um, uh, Dayton Ward, who's a, uh, a, a was sort of kind of consulting on the book, said, "Let's just plead the fifth on this one. Yeah, let, let's just say oh, <laughs> that one is consigned to security files. <laughs> <laughs> so if in doubt, you know, you, you can always sort of uh, file it under military intelligence or something." <laughs> Fair enough. Redacted by the Department of Temporal Investigations. We can't. Yeah, there's, there's a bit in uh, uh, the, there's a spoof novel of Lord of the Rings called Board of the Rings, and every time one of the characters points out a plot hole, the uh, the Gandalf character Good Golf goes, "Oh, alas, alack." So I think that's sort of my, <laughs> my rule: that oh, alas. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot speak of that. <laughs> just a little bit of hand waving, and oh yeah, we'll explain that later, and just never. But we do. I mean, uh, we do genuinely try to kind of you know not not contradict or um you know to um we try and get it right yeah that's fair enough is that uh, is that what uh, uh, it's true in the television version lisa that you're you know or or sometimes is it a case of there might be a really good story and you just have to fudge the continuity a little well I mean, as Una pointed out, I mean, you don't want to you don't want to take the fans out of the story, you know, and you don't want a viewer to, to kind of catch on that and go, well, that's not, that's not what happened. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you do want to focus on what makes a good story. 
So we would always try really hard to be, uh, to be consistent with the continuity. But because Voyager was sort of separated from the rest of Starfleet, we didn't have an awful lot of sort of entanglements with, you know, with what was our last encounter with, you know, Spock or with Picard or anybody like that, because we didn't have any contact with anybody else. So it actually made our, our continuity a little bit e easier. Okay. Um, so having written it kind of extensively on, on TV for TV, I mean, what were the diff what are the differences between writing for TV and writing prose? Oh, I think Aside it's very different. I, I think writing prose is a lot harder, personally, um, because writing for television, you're basically writing an outline. You know, you're because the the rest of the crew is going to come in. You know, the actors are going to come in, and the set designers, and the director, and the props guy, and everybody's going to come in and sort of fill in the details. But when you're writing prose, you have to fill in all those details. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to describe the set and you need to say what the actor is thinking and, you know, what's what props they use and all that kind of stuff. So I found writing prose to be more challenging. OK, that's interesting. I think it's uh, yeah, I, I would I thought it might have just been the formatting, but no, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. Um, and which which of your episodes is a fa is your favorite your own personal favorite and are you most proud of and, and which would you change if you could <laughs> <laughs> uh, well my favorite is probably blood fever um with uh, balana and paris kind of uh, beginning their relationship in a way and uh, i just thought that was a really good episode for balana and she was one of my favorite characters uh, i also really like um innocence with tuvok uh dealing with a bunch of children and um <laughs> So th those are probably my favorites. Uh, there are, of course, some that I would I would change if I could. Uh, probably favorite son is is not one of my favorites that I wrote. Um, but uh, I, I've been told that actually it's been used by a Duke professor in his class on evolution that he uses uh, in, in genetics that he uses favorite son sort of the the plot about the the genes that have been hiding in in Harry Kim's genes as an example of you know, to, to use in class. And actually Garrett Wong has showed up in his class sometimes to talk about that episode as well. So oh, wow. he, even though it's not one of my favorites, I guess it has uh, served some good purpose. Every episode is somebody's favorite episode, I, I think, so. maybe. Apart from maybe Code of Honor, but let's say nothing more about that. <laughs> um, so, so um, I'm here to uh, I'm here to bring the love for Move Along Home. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so James, you you've a very prolific author. Um, I just wondered uh, what you know if if I was starting my uh, time reading the, work, the works of James Swallow, which would be the first book you would recommend and, and, and which is the best? I, I, that's like asking me to pick one of my favorite children, you know, um, it, out of my Star Trek works. I, I say like, you know, go for the one that you like the best. Like, uh, you know, if you're a Deep Space Nine fan, try the Terok Nor novel. If you like classic Trek, read uh, The Latter Fire. If you like Next Generation, try. Um, uh, the stuff of dreams. I mean, but if you want to go back to sort of the the beginning of my writing career, I actually have to say is is my my writing career is, is like is intertwined with that of Star Trek magazine in a yep. very very <laughs> real way. In fact, <laughs> Star Trek magazine, the original magazine that Nick was talking about, there was my first ever paying piece of professional work writing about Star Trek. So that's the first time Star Trek actually earned money for me. Being a Star Trek fan earned money for me, I should say. And uh, I used to write um, articles for, I used to write the book reviews as well until I, until I got the opportunity to write the books. And then they said, you can't do that anymore. But Star Trek magazine got me the opportunity to, to go to Paramount and to interview people. Uh, and often what would happen was the, um, a lot of the writers, I think enjoyed, because we were all fans, enjoyed interviewing the actors, but I always wanted to talk to people like Lisa because I wanted to be a writer and so I was always kind of I would sneak questions into my interviews so I would say you know how you know what's going on in the story of this character and and how would you deal with the problem in act three you know and just so I was, I was quietly getting my own education as a scriptwriter from these other writers 
And uh, that got me the opportunity to pitch for, for Voyager. And, uh, and that kind of, uh, that opened the door to me being someone who's a Star Trek writer. Um, so I've got to say, hand on heart, uh, thank you, Star Trek magazine. <laughs> and it's kind of it's odd for me to be here. You know, it's, for me, it's like coming full circle, being able to write a story for this. It's, uh, you know, it's my, my Star Trek career is kind of like, you know, coming back to where it, where it started once again, which is really kind of fun to be here and to be doing this. I was um, I was editor when James was uh, writing the book reviews, and and I remember when you wrote that uh, picture on pitching to Voyager, actually as well. I remember I, I remember you pitching that to me in the first place. Uh, so yeah, it's, um, goes, we go way back with that. But uh, yeah, I mean you know it's 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 been great to watch your career you know uh, blossom in the way it has. So uh, yeah, it's been lovely to see. Well. Also, I feel we have to help you with your challenge to uh, write <laughs> multiple stories. So maybe maybe you'll write another story for us um, in a different era of Star Trek. Uh. Oh, I'd absolutely love to. I mean, you know, doing short stories. Um, I mean, you know, Lisa talked about the differences between doing prose uh, and doing script writing. But the thing about doing short stories, and I know uh, Una's done a lot of short fiction as well. I'm sure she'll agree with me on this, is that it's a completely different tool set. From writing a novel because especially the stories we're doing for explorer because they're very short mm -hmm. so you have to you know you, you've got to hit the beach hit the ground running get your story idea out there it's like telling a good joke right you know it's got to set up your set up your concept and then pay off your punchline and you have to really kind of compact everything into the sort of brevity of the narrative it's such a fun challenge to do i think that's that's very true having obviously seen the stories and, and read them and and edited them although not much they've all come in really clean <laughs> thanks everyone um i have to say that the uh i have to say i'm, I'm really impressed how how much storytelling you pack into you know a s relatively small amount of words than i'm sure you're used to working with so it, it, it you really have created uh absolute gold there so thank you all of you for that it's uh very good work you'll you'll see you in issue two hopefully <laughs> um so uh yeah una i guess i need to ask you the same question um if i wanted to start uh my you know build my una mccormack library where do i start well i i think if you're going to read anything by me it'll it'll help to like cardassians so uh <laughs> make, make make sure you're quite keen on cardassians uh, and uh, if you do like Cardassians and you've watched the whole of Deep Space Nine, then you might enjoy my book, The Neverending Sacrifice, which is basically the story of Deep Space Nine, but from the point of view of somebody on Cardassia Prime. So uh, it, it's like the story of the Dominion War, but from, you know, the, the other side. Um, so you might enjoy that. Or I, I think, like Jim said, um, I've written a, a Picard novel that people might enjoy. And of course, my, my autobiographies, I think um, people, pe people might enjoy those, Janeway uh, and Spock. I'm, I'm really jealous now of uh, Jim's idea. I think I, 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 I've been, at the back of my mind, I've been trying to write all of the doctors uh, for Doctor Who, but uh, I'm, I, I'm going to think about that one now, about doing a Lower Decks novel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, pitched, I pitched a lower deck story actually but they were like no too soon for that so right okay yeah, I, yeah. I, I, think, I think to be honest uh you know i was having this conversation with somebody online and we were saying how because lower decks is a very visual show and it's like packed to the yeah. visual references is maybe a comic book would be the best place for it mm. but to be honest i think a short story because you know because again the, the sort of joke format i think because of the comedy that uh, Lower Decks has. I think you could pay off a really funny short story with Lower Decks and kind of not yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Comic book or, uh, or short, I think, uh, or graphic graphic novel, I think we're meant to say no, aren't we? But, um, but I, a, a novel would not be the right format for that show. I'm very excited about Prodigy. I'd, um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what that's like. Una, I've just hit on the idea. You've, you want to do all the Doctors for Doctor Who. How about all the Doctors for Star Trek? Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm doing quite well. I've already done Crusher yeah. and Pulaski. Yeah. So, uh... yeah. Don't forget. Don't forget to give me a co-credit on, please. Thank you. Absolutely. Um... <laughs> so... Keep hiring me. McCoy autobiography next. Then, obviously, that's the best. McCoy. That's... Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow, <laughs> that would be interesting. Vashir's <laughs> uh... casebook. Yeah. Yeah, Vashir's casebook. <laughs> you know, the 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 Doctor from Voyager. Like, it'd be interesting to hear his point of view on things. Um, 
So one of the big things in Star Trek Explore is we have a supplement all about Captain Kirk. So I wondered um, if you could, well, one of the features in there is um, top 10 Kirk moments, um, which uh, I'm hoping the readers will enjoy, although it is slightly controversial. I shall, I shall say no more because um, we like a bit of controversy. I just wondered um, if I could go and ask all of you, which is your favourite Captain Kirk or Admiral Kirk moment? And let us start with Mr. Nick Jones. I'd probably have to say um, it, uh, Star Trek Generations, maybe controversially, because just the, the scene where the scene in the Nexus where he's with uh, where Picard finds him in the Nexus, just that whole I just love that whole scene where they where you know Kirk's up chopping wood and and you know he's got this lovely log cabin and you know this great life and it's and it uh, and it's. Um, yeah, it's just very sweet. I mean, the whole, I find the whole film quite emotional, really. I mean, I'm probably a minority in that, in that regard, but, uh, but I just there's quite a, there's, there's great themes of mortality and uh, the, the paths not taken and, and that kind of stuff in it. And, and the, that, but just that, that's, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's so many you could choose for, for Kirk, but, I, but yeah, I do, I do, I, I've got a very, very, um, yeah, very sweet spot for that, uh, for that particular scene. That's a, that's a, I, I agree with you. That's a good choice. I, I must. Have, I blub like a baby whenever I watch Star Trek Generations. And I'm not ashamed to say it. D- Data's relationship. Right. Data's relationship with that cat is enough to send me right off the edge. I can tell you, it's really it just oh, unbelievable. Um, <laughs> James, but uh, you know, I'm, I, I can't pick just one because I'm thinking of my favourite <laughs> Kirkian speeches from the original series. You know. The one that immediately comes to mind is risk is our business, that's yeah. mm-hmm. which is really great. And then there's the one about um, maybe we're not meant to have an easy life. Maybe we're meant to claw and scratch our way up. You know, mm-hmm. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it right now. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that uh, Shatner's delivery of that stuff. I always like Kirk doing that kind of what gives you the right speech, you know, where mm-hmm. he has that righteous indignation and he stands up for the little guy mm-hmm. and for humanity. I think, but yeah, I think if I had to just pick one, I would say the the risk is our business speech, which I think encapsulates so much of that kind of Starfleet ethos. Mm. And it also tells you so much about the kind of man that Kirk is. Yeah, that's a good choice. Yeah, these are all brilliant choices. I'm, I'm wishing I'd included them in the list. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Lisa. Uh, I think my, my mind goes straight to the Wrath of Khan. Uh, when he's dealing with uh, sort of the the error of his past, and it kind of comes back to bite him in the ass. And when he's sort of fighting with, in his battles with Khan, when he's outsmarting, you know, one of these genetically supermen like Khan, I think that's a really good battle of wills. Oh, totally. Yeah, he, he's, you know, he, he doesn't care about the odds, Kirk. He, he kind of just nope. gets in there and... Uh, does his best and and he wins because he's William Shatner. That's why. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes he's Chris Pine, but mainly he's William Shatner. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, Una. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to go sublime to the ridiculous. I'm going to go for the bits in. Uh, I've got. I've got two actually. I'm going to. But I'm going to go for the bits in uh, the one with the whales where he sees Spock <laughs> swimming and he's all. <laughs> I just think it's priceless and uh, it, you know it's, it's played for broad laughs but it, it's perfectly pitched but I also can have a little shout out for Boston Legal where Denny flips his mobile phone open it goes <laughs> 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 absolutely joyous so I, I'm going to pick those very good choices. Again, we hadn't put Boston Legal in the uh, top ten, so that's that's really good. <laughs> Don't think that's in there. No. Uh, no, no. But again, there's always room for a second top ten. Kirk's a big enough character to uh, to to do two of uh, those <laughs> in there. So uh, very true. Um, Nick, uh, to kind of just turn the spotlight on you for a second here. Um, there we go. That's it. No, no. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, you've edited many many editions of the star trek magazine over the years what what have been your favorite experiences aside from this one you're having right now obviously apart from this one yes um i mean it's hard, it's hard to say it, i mean the 
came onto the magazine in the first place was uh, it was was great. It was you know it was a just I mean before before I was editor of Star Trek magazine, I was a, I was a music journalist, so it was quite a quite a change from what I had been doing to to Star Trek. But it was great just to you know I'd I'd sort of slightly fallen out of love with music, and it was just great to indulge another passion. You know, it, it's something that I'd always loved, and now I, and I got the chance to. To be in charge of the magazine, um, but there's there's been so many. There's I'll tell you one one good one is uh, a, a, a Destination Star Trek. I think it was Destination Star Trek 2018 in Birmingham, where um uh, and I was there, you know, just hanging out, covering the event and and watching panels and and doing this and that. And then I got uh, I got a call from CBS to come and uh, an urgent call to come and, come and meet them. And um, I was like, oh, okay. I, I knew I was supposed to have a meeting with them at some point, but I wasn't sure, you know, when it was. So I rushed. I, I was out of the hall, rushed back into the hall, uh, and they said, meet, "Meet us at photo booth A." I was like, okay, I'll meet you there. I'll come come into the photo. Well, I, I went into the photo booth, and it was the it was the Star Trek Discovery photo session, so where you could have your photo taken with the entire cast. So I all of a sudden got propelled into a picture with the discovery cast which i wasn't expecting at all so I, and i was like and i had a bag of crisps in hand and a, and a, and a drink which i had to chuck to someone else but just when, I was, when i had to go and sit down i was like okay hi, hello everyone. i sat down and said to everyone I said uh everyone say cheese and they all kind of looked at me like, <laughs> cheese and fun. onion yeah. <laughs> but it was a lovely photo but yes that was uh, that was that's an abiding memory i think of mine my time at various times in Star Trek magazine. Well, that's that's quite astonishing, and that photo has been used in the magazine. Uh, yeah, well, but, yes, I made a point of putting it in my editorial, editorial in, in one issue, so yeah, I couldn't couldn't let that go to waste. <laughs> the cast of Discovery in a very shocked-looking uh, editor. <laughs> they, they, were they, they, they were fresh. They were professionals. They were, they, you know, they just turned their smiles onto the camera straight away. Um, so okay, that was, it was great. Well, it had to be. They didn't want a bad write-up from, from you in the magazine. <laughs> Not that we would ever do that, of course. Um, <laughs> so it feels like we're we're entering like a new phase of Star Trek magazine with the uh, Explorer launching on November the 3rd. Um, I just wondered really, why why do we all think, or you all think, that Star Trek has managed to endure over the years i mean it's it's stronger now than i think it's ever been it's it's there's all these shows in production there's you know these wonderful books that you guys have been involved in there's comics there's video games there's the conventions are coming back in a big way um so james what what is what is <laughs> it's a big question but um what is the magic of star trek do you think you know on on some level it's it's an exciting sci-fi adventure with lots of sort of flashy things and cool stuff happening in it and you know on that kind of surface level it's just great entertainment and you can consume that uh, and you can have a lot of fun with it but star trek has that unique element as well that kind of bubbles away just underneath the surface where it asks us sensible serious questions about the human condition and about the world that we're living in right now. And it reflects them in this kind of funhouse mirror of, of weird, fun sci-fi. And it allows us to, to look at those things at a bit of a remove and maybe consider questions that like, you know, if they were presented to you kind of flatly, maybe you wouldn't be that happy about, uh, about addressing. And so Star Trek has the ability, I think, to sort of sneak this stuff in under our radar and just entertain you and make you think. And it's done that throughout its entire life cycle and it continues to do that and i think that is the the unique quality it has that makes it such an enduring phenomenon well and uh una i'm not sure what i can add to that actually i'd say that the the characters now are, are getting a kind of timelessness to them i think um Kirk and Spock uh, and McCoy are now starting to and we're seeing this because you're we're seeing them recast they're now sort of um moving into that zone of folk hero aren't they i think that these uh, it uh, something particularly about that triad uh, i i think has become like a cultural touchstone you know they're, they're they're getting into the level of uh superman or beyond that something like something like robin hood or uh you know they're, they're getting sort of folk mm -hmm. 
status in a way so all of, of what Jim said and another thing is that I, I think these these programs come back they have their moments people were watching Deep Space Nine in lockdown it was an, and Voyager and it was really speaking to them I think that that sense of you know well being a, a, a small group of people adrift from their family or else uh, being caught up in a sort of impending disaster they all have their moment to shine the different shows and also, and the last thing I promise, it's a really nice bunch of people that you, you know, once you, you start writing or you get involved or you stop going to conventions and meeting the fans, they're just really nice people. And that helps. <laughs> <That's fair enough. laughs> and, I mean, it feels definitely, and it feels like, um, it feels like Voyager in particular um, has hit a second wave and people are rediscovering it or discovering it for the first time and for the groundbreaking show that it, really is um lisa what do you think the ongoing appeal of star trek is although it has been articulated really well but it has <laughs> but i think that one, one of the elements that it has is an inherent optimism mm -hmm. uh, that in the future in the far future not only will humans still be here but we'll be better you know that we'll continue to evolve and improve and we'll go out and explore the galaxy and all these kind of wonderful things will happen in the future and I think that that's, that's just a nice sort of inherently optimistic point of view that, that uh, I think people need. Okay. That's, that's more so now than ever, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, I should say that, Una, I have a, a copy in my hand, um, so just lift it up here, of the autobiography of Mr. Spock. Um, I see your Spock, I raise you Janeway. Uh, it's a look at two books, wow. Um, <laughs> this is uh, utterly incredible. I had no idea his skills included writing. Um, but um, as someone who's had to edit his work, um, I just wondered how difficult was it to write uh, his life story, especially with the added complication of discovery, which adds a whole new uh, kind of thread to his story. It, it was a, a little bit the way that Ginger Rogers said about Dancing with Fred Astaire, you had to do it backwards and in high heels. It was a bit, <laughs> it was a, I think threading that needle was, a, I, I mean, I love that kind of challenge, but it, it was a particularly tricky one, I think. Uh, and not only were you trying to manage things like get the voice right and not disappoint people, but there was so much to, to link together. Uh, so it was, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was really good fun. <laughs> <laughs> And it's great fun to read as well. Uh, good, good. And is, it was, uh, I mean, when you're writing the book, did you have to take into account, of course, we've got strange new worlds coming up and that's obviously a, yeah. an unknown yeah, at we, this point. We, we sort of tried to make the book work without having much data about that because obviously it was, it, it's in production. So, you know, the, the, the writer's room is still sort of you know working on stuff so yeah we we tried to make it work that it would it would stand alongside that but you know we we, we weren't able perhaps to go if we were doing it next year we'd have more uh, more information to put in there but uh, fingers crossed it all it all holds together yeah i'm sure it will i'm sure it will even if it doesn't there'll be that little continuity thing that you have to, to yeah, tighten yeah. it's fine yeah it can be done and when you're writing a book like that do you have to put or or do you do you put little Easter eggs in? Are there things that the fans might spot? And go, ah, oh, absolutely. Kind of... Yes. I, ho I hope people will spot uh, a few things. So um, I, I really, I, I drew on, on some of the other novels that have been written and we, we didn't feel beholden to them because, you know, you're writing a new story, but just the odd nod to other people who've, who've written in that universe, uh, I felt would be a nice uh, sort of gesture in the book. So uh, hopefully people will spot things and see things. Yeah. And one of the things, one of the things I was really taken with and my daughter, who's three, was was really excited about were the um, the illustrations in the book, which um, are quite amazing. There's a, there's some um, <laughs> little spot, cheeky spots. baby baby spot face. Uh, she she just kept going. Look at his ears. Look at his ears. I was like, no, we celebrate differences in Star Trek. Don't keep make a thing of it. But yes, um, about your ears. Uh, yes, what about your ears? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I mean, how do you do you get involved? in planning that sort of that's a really artwork. fun bit of it actually uh, the 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 artist is russell walks and he, he did the illustration of the jango book as well and I, I think they're all absolutely beautiful and myself and russell and the book editor kat camacho at mm. titan uh we sort of sit well we sit down we've got an email chain and we go um 
oh, here's here's a moment which here, we kind of come up with a, of a list of about 24 things or maybe 20 things that we think would would work well. Uh, and then one of us goes, no, not sure about that. Or have you thought of this? And then we kind of whittle it down and we're sort of throwing things at Russell until he goes, yeah, that sparks something, that sparks something. So uh, it's, it's very fun. It's very sort of, uh, you know, putting your heads together and thinking what people would enjoy seeing as well. But, you know, the little chubby, he's got a little chubby face. Oh, yeah. I, love <laughs> I love it. Gorgeous. Yeah. I love it. I love it. The big so... grin. Yeah, it's a yeah. lovely picture. Oh, yeah. bless him. Oh, we need the further adventures of Baby Spock, baby Spock I think. Yeah. The thing. There we go. That's the next book. Um, so, and also, of course, there's, um, I think, a first for this kind of book, maybe. Um, there are some recipes. Yeah, yeah. We, we thought that would be really did you... good fun. How did you come um, up with recipes? Well, I, I was watching the bit where they were they were eating the uh, the beans, pork and beans. I thought I, I have a, a friend of mine is a, a, a very very good chef, a Michelin starred chef, and um, I thought you know I'll I'll drop him a note and see whether he'd like to cook cook up a recipe for us. That'd be fun to put in. And the minute we'd done that, we thought well, we if you're going to eat, you've got to have something to drink. So. Uh, uh, we went back to the cocktails book and got permission to reprint the mint juleps. And the, the sort of conceit is that uh, this is what McCoy has left uh, um, Spock in his will. Yeah, <laughs> this, is Amazing. This, this is what I'm bequeathing to you. Go and have fun or something. I don't know, go and, go and eat with friends. And uh, it's a very McCoy thing. So we, we slip them in, in at the back as an extra treat. So I hope people will try them and... Uh, you know, let me know. Hashtag it Spock's beans or something. <laughs> and just a final question on the the Spock book. What were there any authors who were influences on writing it? Oh, Diane Twain was very significant, I think, as well. And I'd always at the back of my mind, I'm thinking of the the late great Vonda McIntyre, whose whose mm. three novelisations of those movies are just absolutely stellar uh so um lots of people at the back of my mind but but those in particular absolutely well we will we will drink a mint julep in their honor i think uh, tonight um so th thank you for joining us everyone it's been fantastic um thank you very much for writing such brilliant stories for the the magazine thank you for editing the magazine nick <laughs> thank you <laughs> you don't get thanked enough um and so Star Trek Explorer is available on November the 3rd. If you go to Titan Comics, uh, the web, Titan Comics online, you can subscribe, um, which is well worth subscribing to. Sometimes, you know, you, you just want to make sure you get your copy. I, can't, I don't know about you guys, but if I miss a copy of anything, I'd go nuts trying to find it. And we don't want to be going on eBay buying stuff. We want to buy it fresh. Um, the autobiography, autobiography of Mr. Spock is out now, um, and it's only logical to buy a copy. I've been working on that all day. There you go. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and if you've enjoyed this, um, um, I hope you've enjoyed this, um, then please check out on YouTube. There's um, Forbidden Planet TV, which includes interviews with stars of uh, sci-fi horror fantasy writers well writers are stars uh what am i saying there we are um uh, including a, a very good interview i think all star trek fans will be interested uh, in listening to with william shatner captain kirk himself wow i know <laughs> uh anyway have a great comic con and uh take care everyone bye thank you if you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.